Welcome to MSL Talk with Tom Caravella, a podcast specifically designed for MSLs and all things field medical. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast. My guest today is Ariel Katz. He's the CEO and founder of H1, today's sponsor of this episode. And we discussed the role of MSLs in achieving health equity. So really interesting conversation. Ariel is awesome. I think you guys are really going to like this. Don't forget to follow me on LinkedIn and Instagram. Uh, check us out on YouTube. We've got awesome videos on YouTube um, of each episode. And then join us for MSL Talk Live which is the first Tuesday of every month at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. And that is on LinkedIn Live. Um, those conversations have been amazing. So I invite you guys to join us for that. And as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. And uh, hope you like this. Hey, Ariel, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining me. Thanks. Really excited to be here. Awesome. I am excited. Um, guys, for those of you uh, joining us today, I know Ariel for a long time. We've been traveling in this same, you know, medical affairs support universe, our companies are vendors at all the conferences together. And um, I'm excited to have him on the podcast because he's a super guy, he's super smart. He's built a great company, which by the way, um, H1 is the sponsor for this episode. Um, so I'm really grateful to have you guys um, H1 is actually the connecting force for global HCP clinical scientific and research information. Um, they have the H1 Connect platform, which democratizes access to HCP knowledge and groundbreaking insights for life sciences, academic institutions, health systems, and payers. Um, the H1 Connect fuels a robust product that helps customers discover and engage industry experts, drive equitable research, access ground, groundbreaking science, and accelerate commercial success with the most robust and accurate healthcare professional data. So you guys have to check these guys out. They're um, a pioneer in this space and you can get more information at h1.co. So Ariel, let's get into you, my friend. Why don't you do a quick intro? Yeah, although you gave a good intro. It's hard to keep it that far. Uh, my name's Ariel. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of H1. I've been at this for about five years now. So we've been at the same radio for five years, same conferences, working the same, same stuff. Uh, live in New York, married, uh, and a couple of dogs and a son. It's me. That's awesome. Well, I'm really grateful to have you on, my friend. And um, congratulations on all your success and everything that you've done to help the medical affairs community. You know, and, and when you and I were talking, you came up with this idea of doing an episode on health equity, which I think is amazing because we haven't done anything um, that has covered this topic. So I'm curious, and just to start, why don't you define, you know, give us your definition of health equity and what that looks like? Yeah, so uh, prevalent, prevalence to prevention. So um, when you think about a condition, diabetes, or pick any condition, prostate cancer, breast cancer, uh, what does the prevalence look like in the world? And how is that represented in, our, in the life sciences community when it comes to clinical trials, who MSLs are engaging with the medical affairs, who commercial is focused on? Uh, and if the condition that you're trying to really cure and treat uh, is not being given the same attention across all the constituents that have that condition, uh, that's not equitable. Uh, and it leads to mistrust in the healthcare systems, which is what we saw during COVID in a lot of communities, minority communities, different communities. Um, and that's not the way that we're going to build the equitable health system that people trust. And it's and not an institution that people trust. And so health equity is really important. Within that, there's a lot of different sub factors around like social determinants for health. Uh, you're hitting everyone with the same education level. Generally, that's not the way it works. Medicine, you focus on those academics. It's not everybody in the world. Uh, and you want to look for people, sort of educational levels that might not be high degrees, PhDs. You want to make sure you're focusing on people with certain income brackets. Mm -hmm. This is all in social determinants for health. You want to focus on people that come from different and diversity and inclusion, different races, ethnicities, backgrounds, religions, everything you can imagine. Um, and to me, that's equitable and that's representative healthcare. 
Uh, and so um, that's what it means to me. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all encompassing. It's not just disease state. It's not just a certain patient population. It's not just a socioeconomic or racial. It's across the board. There's in efficiencies in the system to be able to make it equitable for a lot of these different subgroups. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. What do you think is the big, what, like, how did this problem occur? How does there become such inequity um, over the course of the, you know, over the course of healthcare, but you know, why are certain groups misrepresented, underrepresented and, and how do we, how do we wind up here? Yeah, I mean, there's like deep systemic issues in our system and incentives. If we're talking about life sciences companies, they didn't really do anything about it up until a few years ago. And so, for example, um, the FDA released guidance on representation in clinical trials like months ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, Life sciences company has been around for years. They didn't do anything about it before. The FDA, the U.S. government didn't do anything about it. And it's not like life science companies are self-policing themselves. They couldn't recruit any patients. They're not going to be like, I'm going to recruit a minority patient. That's even harder. And so they didn't do it. If you're talking about medical affairs, how often 10 years ago did you hear a medical affairs organization, organization say, I'm going to make sure that my MSLs are engaging with a representative body of constituents? Um, or did you hear them say, I need to engage with the top thoughtful, top thought leaders that can influence and educate the rest of the physician community? You heard the mm. latter. And so there, there wasn't an incentive to do so. I think the world has changed over the past five years. Um, and that's no longer on the back burner. It's more of a top of mind priority for a lot of these organizations, which is a good thing for the world. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's, I mean, it makes sense. Everything that you're saying makes sense. And it's should be be the responsibility of the FDA. And it should be, there should be some governance in industry, pharma, biotech, um, to be able to police this a bit better. I think that there, I mean, we all know that there's different factors involved in, you know, who makes the most noise and maybe um, has the most clout sometimes gets the most attention. You don't want to think that you want to think it should be all patient focused. Um, and it should be the, the science and, and the benefit to the patient should dictate it. But unfortunately it often doesn't. No, it doesn't. It, it should. But if you go back like 15 years, people are 30 years, people would say putting chemicals in a river by a chemical company is a bad idea. It's probably a bad idea. Bad for the community, bad for the world, like there's bad. These chemicals are dangerous. They didn't do anything about it. Yeah. Uh, incentives are wrong. Uh, and then government stepped in and said, no, you can't put poisonous chemicals that turn deers orange and children to have five arms in the river. So they stopped doing it. Uh, and so the equivalent here is like, no, you, you can't really just say this breast cancer affects women. It also affects men. And so you can't just test it on women and then say it works for men. Uh, it's not really the way it works. Uh, and so you're starting to see, that's a very basic example. You're starting to see uh, people become more aware of those issues. Well, and I think that there's gotta be better. There's just, I think there's, this has to be addressed better. There's gotta be better criteria and guidance for how um, not only drugs can, should be approved, but um, you know, how we can get treatment to patients in a more equitable fashion. Um, and I, I know that that's the goal of everyone, but it seems like it becomes um, a bit of a chess match. If that's it's, right. a, yeah, it's very difficult. And there's a lot of mistrust. Think about the vaccine. It's like the biggest thing on stage ever. Probably safe. Most people believe it's safe. The science says it's safe, but certain communities didn't trust it. And then you have to ask yourselves why. And why are those communities not trusting the vaccine? And you could point to politics, it mm. could be true. But then there's also, there's actually deep-seated mistrust in our healthcare systems for a good reason. I mean, there's been mishandling of different communities and minorities in the past, but it's also the, the until recently, I'm talking in the last five years, there wasn't much outreach to minority groups within our country, around the world, when it comes to education around healthcare, education mm. about new medicines. Now that's starting to change with patient advocacy groups having more of a seat at the table at pharma companies. Um, 
minority organizations having more of a seat at the table at pharma companies. But that, that's a, a definitely a new development. And how do MSLs fit into this? Because I know that you know you came up with this idea of you know how MSLs um, can help achieve health equity. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So MSLs are awesome. So uh, MSLs, their job is fairly simple. It's a hard job, but it's a simple one. Educate the community on the latest science and medicine that could lead to better patient outcomes. So the high, high level of what they need to do. Um, now the question is, who are they educating? Are they spending their time focusing on the physician at Dana-Farber Cancer Research Institute? Or are they making sure that they're going to the suburbs of Boston as well and educating that community doctor that's not at the academic medical center that's treating patients below the poverty line? And who MSLs are talking to? When MSLs engage with healthcare professionals, it educates them and it changes practice in a positive way a lot of the times, which is great. And so thinking about who they're engaging with is the start of it. Uh, and we're seeing that change happen, which is great. So it's not just those key opinion leaders, there's a changing definition of stakeholder community. It's care teams, it's physician's assistants, it's community doctors, it's regional doctors, it's folks that are treating patients and getting and focusing on those individuals will change, change a lot, I think. And we're, we're seeing that happen. Uh, Right now. So you so you you say you're seeing that happen, and and do you think that's because leadership has recognized this and it's coming down from the top, or is it being you know how how is how is it changing and like where's that directive coming from? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, depending on the company, who an MSL engages with is up to leadership or the MSL. Mm -hmm. so you could do companies and you know changes. Um, and so the, the short answer is like both, um, but it's more like the social contract and societal change that we recognize. You can't just talk to a uh, ivory tower academic at Yale Cancer Center and everyone's going to listen to them. It's not, it's not the way it works. Uh, I mean, you need to talk to that individual because they change the field in that, in that field in that field of science. But you, it, it won't work. It won't reach the community unless you engage with the folks in the community in certain communities. Uh, and so we're seeing, I think, both both MSLs and headquarters and leadership are, are changing. Yeah. And you guys provide the data. You have the data. So it's not we like it's not a data issue. Right. I mean, it's it, you know, it's there's enough information for pharma and biotech companies to be able to adjust the course of action by having the right information. I would say it's actually a new thing. I'd say in the last like three to four years, it's possible. OK, So three to four years ago, if you went to Pfizer and said, because Pfizer does work in atopic dermatitis. You went to them and said, tell me every top physician in New York City that treats atopic dermatitis that has over 85% Hispanic patients. And that physician speaks Spanish. It's a hard question. Uh, today, if you ask them that, they could give an answer in about a second. And so I think the technology has moved forward to enable them to have information to better uh, solve some of these problems. Well, and maybe that's part of the reason why there's a problem to begin with is maybe there just wasn't enough data available um, to be able to prevent this from happening. I'm sure there's, I know there's a lot of other reasons. We just talked about them. We don't have to go yeah. back into it. But I think that that seems like um, a good way to help moving forward to be able to provide a better approach um, to creating this health equity piece. Um, what else? What else do you think pharma and biotech companies can and should be doing? So, what we're also seeing happen is MSLs get more involved in clinical development across the board. Biggest issue for clinical teams: they can't recruit patients. The sites they pick fail. Don't have successful clinical trials. They shut down sites. It takes longer than you think. It takes longer than they wanted to. They spent more money than they planned to. Huge problem. That's the like number one issue if you asked anyone running a clinical trial. Can't find patients, can't find the right sites. So what they're doing is trying to touch all corners of that's they could solve the problem with. And one of those is the medical affairs organization. Who's in the field talking to the physicians to know where those patients are? MSLs. Uh, and so uh, they're tapping on MSLs shoulders uh, to help get involved in clinical development. And so what else can these pharma companies do and biotech companies do? Make sure when they tap on the shoulder of the MSL, they're using criteria to, to ensure that whoever they're selecting, the sites or the principal investigators, the physicians involved in the clinical trial, is a representative bunch. 
and not a homogenous group of individuals. And they're making sure it's a diverse group of individuals that see different types of patient populations. Uh, and that's a, a key thing that needs to happen as MSLs get more involved in clinical development and site selection. Mm, yeah. What, you mentioned patient advocacy before. I mean, how much does that play a factor in this equation? I think it's huge. Um, and we're seeing it more and more have a voice at pharma companies. They used, pharma used to say they had a voice. I don't know how loud it was. Uh, now I think you see these new roles pop up like chief patient officer. Didn't it exist five years ago? True. I, don't, I couldn't find one. Uh, so there, there's like people that are being hired and they're at the table representing patient advocacy groups and their entire job is to engage with patient advocacy groups. The patient, the chief patient officer tightly related to medical affairs. Um, but I, I think the, it's becoming more and more important and farmer can no longer just like placate them. They need to be involved or they won't support the therapy. Additionally, therapies are becoming more and more precise precision medicine, targeted therapies set for a smaller patient population. So the, the advocacy, advocacy group for like high cholesterol, it's like, eh, it's important, but if you have high cholesterol, it's fine. The advocacy group for spinal muscular dystrophy type 2D, there's only a thousand patients in the world that have that. Right. A lot of them are part of the advocacy group. Not, uh, my dad is high cholesterol. I don't think he's a part of the patient advocacy group. Uh, uh, so I think like they're becoming more important also given the changing in, in therapy landscape. Well, I think that's a good point. I think that we're in a, we're in a unique time right now because there are so many advances in science and technology that we have so much more available. There's all of these treatments and there's all this stuff that's being developed for rare diseases and stuff that never had anything at all in the past. So I think that just by the very nature of the volume of what's now becoming available, it's created this imbalance, so to speak. And I think that that's what's uh, one of the reasons why I think health uh, patient advocacy is so important is because you want to have adequate representation to be able to say, hey, this is important and here's why. Yeah. Um, but what about the patient though? Like, can the, it, What can the patient do on their side to help their cause in this, in this issue? In regards to health equity or like- make In, sure in regards to health equity, I mean, how does the patient defend, you know, how do they stick up for themselves? How do, how do they have a voice in this? The patient's- they actually have a pretty loud voice, especially with social media and what's going on there. So when you ask a, and we, we get asked this by some medical affairs teams, who are the social media leaders in sickle cell? Uh, and like, uh, who has a loud voice and who has a scientific share of voice around that? Some of the uh, biggest people is the caregiver, the parent of the child, um, the sister, the brother. And they talk about it all the time. They're loud in the patient advocacy group, but they're also just loud in the community and they're an influencer. And engaging them and educating them and bringing them to the table is critical. And so if, uh, as a caregiver, as a patient uh, who wants a voice, it's being a part of that advocacy group and just talking. And I think pharma comp I know pharma companies, life science companies are starting to listen because they have to, because people now have a microphone, very large microphone in social media that they didn't have 10 years ago. Yeah. Oh, no, for sure. And it's so much easier now. There's, you know, it, it you know, they're used to it back in the day, I think patient advocacy was uh, advocacy. And I think the patient voice was you had to show up somewhere and, and, you know, picket and, and protest. And, you know, now you there's so many because of the internet, there's so many groups that you could join. And there's the, all the social media outlets that you can work through. Um, but what else is missing? I mean, we talked about the FDA, we talked about MSLs, we talked about pharma companies and patient advocacy and the patients themselves, but what else is missing in this equation? So if you develop a therapy and you bring it to the FDA and there's not a representative patient population, they might get a slap on the wrist and they might tell you, go and run a new study, but they won't flat out reject you. It's guidance. It's not, uh, it's not a law, it's not criteria. Um, the FDA needs to get stricter around this issue. Just like the, uh, the EPA is a weird example because of the thing they just passed in the Supreme Court. But the, for uh, an example is like, you can't smoke cigarettes 
you can't buy a pack of cigarettes unless you're over the age of 18. Is it 18 or 21? Eight, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't One of the two. I assume it's 18. <laughs> if I'm 16 know. years old, I can't go to a bodega and buy a pack of cigarettes. If I say I'm recruiting 100 patients to my uh, non sponsored lung cancer study, and they're all men and there's no representation from women, uh, I should... I should just, it's a law, it's rejected, rejected by the FDA until you have a representative patient population. The representation of the patient population needs to be per percentage-wise the same as the people that have it, the prevalence of the condition. And until the FDA says it's a law, it's really not, it's gonna change, but it's not going to be, it's not gonna be like a, it's gonna be glacial. It's not gonna be a, a quick change. And so the FDA needs to go further in this. And it's not just the FDA, uh, FDA is just one country. Uh, other regulatory bodies around the world also need to take this further and, and go one step further in the requirement, not just guidance around it. Guidance is nice to have. It's like good, it's not bad, but it's not enough. And so I, I, that's one uh, really big change. We're seeing pharma companies hire uh, diversity and inclusion offices, um, which help with awareness and education within their own organization around it. Uh, but there's still more work that needs to happen. But I think the biggest change needs to come from regulators to start, which will, regulators, um, it's the wag that shakes the dog, whatever the saying goes. Yeah, the, they, the tail that wags the dog. Tail that wags the dog. They're the tail. Uh, yeah, the tail that wags the dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, no, and, but he, it's it's true. I, I think that the regulators and the FDA, they it the responsibility has to fall on them because on the pharma side, not to take anything away from everybody's genuine interest in trying to get to a place of equity, but you know, pharma and biotech companies are out there trying to bring drugs to market to help patients. And they have a vested interest based upon whatever therapeutic area they're focused in to get that drug to market. And oh, by the way, they also have an obligation to shareholders, employees, and you know they want to have a profitable organization. So there's a lot of things that is in their purview that they need to be responsible for, not that they don't care about the patient or the equity issue that would exist in patient populations, but it comes down to the governing bodies that really need to police it more than the pharmaceutical companies. That's just my opinion. I mean, I'm-, I'm I agree with you. The incentives are, the incentive for a pharma company is simple. It's bring a therapy to market. It saves lives or helps with conditions, increase quality of life, standard of care. The incentive is not, let's make sure it's representative of who has the condition. Government needs to change that for us. You know, and, and, and the MSLs, getting back to the MSLs, because obviously that's what this podcast is about, is, is you know, the MSL role and, and how, what affects the MSLs. You know, the MSLs have a job to do. They have metrics and KPIs and they have, you know, messages and there's, they have responsibilities. Um, you know, is this their responsibility? I think I... it's... What, I'll ask you, what do you think? <laughs> so if I were a betting man, I don't gamble, although I, I, I did once, but I don't really gamble. <laughs> if I were to bet, uh, I would bet 10 years from now, 2032, uh, there's going to be different criteria for who MSLs are engaging with. Okay. And there's going to be criteria that they need to engage with low and middle income communities and the physicians that are treating the patients in those communities 20 times more than they are today. Guaranteed. There's no way they are just engaging at ASCO. Impossible. Yeah. Because the people living in the, you're seeing wealth inequality gaps expand even more. You're seeing people who don't understand the medicine and the science, which is only becoming more complex. And MSLs are not historically engaging as much with low and middle income communities that and you have the biggest educational gap uh, when it comes to science and medicine. Uh, and I, if I were a betting man, I would bet there would be significantly more uh, engagement that MSLs have with those communities than they do today. And they did five years ago. Yeah. Been, well, no, I mean, if you look at, if you look at what's happened over the course of the past five years and, you know, you kind of extrapolate that down the road, um, I think there's something to be said. I'm, I'm not a betting man either, but I am going to be around in 10 years. So you and I... <laughs> Gonna have we can circle back in and 10 you're going to be around in 10 years. Yeah. Um, now, listen, I hope that that we can move the needle on this. And I hope that um, that 
everybody does their part. I hope the FDA gets better, pharma gets yeah. better, and MSLs can can you know can be aware of this and and help and um, and and the patients become more educated and and the patient advocacy groups can continue to do what they do. So I think that this is there's not one solution for this. I think it's gonna you know what the crazy thing is Pfizer Pfizer one of the best well-known pharma companies in the world, everyone knows them. They just released an RFP, which you can find on their website. Anyone can Google it and find it. Uh, help us find ways to educate healthcare professionals in low and middle income communities about the benefits of COVID. The vaccine. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Not, COVID, not the benefits of getting COVID. Uh, the benefits of like uh, preventative care against COVID. They can't reach them. They don't have access to them. Pfizer's not engaging with them. Pfizer's engaging with high prescribers. In engaging with people that are the top thought leaders, Pfizer needs help doing so. That's like the analogy is like saying LeBron James needs help with scoring a basket. It's like the the biggest and most profitable, most money in the world, biggest brand recognition can't reach them today, and that's because they haven't historically invested in them yesterday. Uh, and so they're aware of it. Pfizer is really cool. Pfizer's doing cool stuff in this area, making sure that they care about representation in medicine, uh, and they're one of the best but they just released an RFP. They can't reach these people in low and middle income communities and educate them about the benefits of the vaccine or taking the, I forgot what their pillow is called. If you get COVID, you take it so you don't get hospitalized. I'm trying mm -hmm. to educate people about it today. Well, and, and you know, if, if history has a, has a tendency to repeat itself, you take, there's leaders that emerge in fields and they set the standards and, um, and they become an example for other organizations that hopefully will follow along and do the same thing. So that might be one a very, very good sign for what's about to come. Um, but hey, man, thank you for what you do on your side. Obviously, you brought this topic up. Bringing this up means awareness. There's going to be a lot of people listening to this, a lot of MSLs that are going to say, hey, well, you know what? What can I do? Um, you yeah. know, maybe maybe I can do a better job or maybe I can talk to my manager about this or maybe I could bring this message back to um, to other powers that be so that individually we can each do our part to try to make a difference and try to help um in in whatever way we can yeah no, i appreciate that and thanks for listening to this critical topic at a important point in this world as trust in our healthcare systems and institutions is more important than ever uh and uh especially with groups that don't have access to the same education or information that other groups have so it's critical right now that was part of my goal is like, when I bring people on this podcast that are way smarter than me, it actually makes me seem smart because I'm really not. But having someone like you come on brings me up a whole nother level. I'll tell my wife you said that. <laughs> well, listen, man, um, I do appreciate you coming on. I think this was a great topic. I think it was a great conversation. Any final thoughts, anything you want to leave off with? No, I, I think it's all of our responsibilities for those MSLs that are out there. Make sure you're focusing on educating not just the top key opinion leaders, but community leaders, people that are seeing low and middle income communities and patients. Uh, that's what's going to move the world forward in the right direction, or we'll have more mistrust if we don't. And so it's uh, opportunities now for all of us taking it in our own hands. Yeah, man. Well, hey, thanks again for, for coming on. Thanks again for sponsoring this episode. Guys, check out H1 um, online. These guys are really pioneers in this space so um check it out and uh thank you for listening i really appreciate all of you guys listening commenting sharing um and we'll see you next time thank you welcome to msl talk with tom caravella a podcast specifically designed for msls and all things field medical